Hello and welcome to The Big Fight. I'm Nidhi Razdan. Here we are just hours away from the budget with all eyes on Finance Minister Nirmala Sita Raman and whether she can announce measures to boost the economy. On the eve of the budget, the government presented its economic survey on Friday, pegging GDP growth at 5% for this fiscal year, which is a sharp decline of the 7% they had predicted last year. But the chief economic advisor says that growth will pick up in the next financial year, ending in March 2021, going up to 6 to 6.5%. Let's take a look at some of the other highlights, though, of the economic survey today. Now, here's what else it says, and this is uh, something actually that the CEA talked about. He said that from 1 AD uh, to, to thalinomics to reforms, he's, he's covered all of these things, and if you want to know what they mean, then, then just listen to what we have to say. Firstly, the economic advisor says that the government has to use its strong mandate to deliver expeditiously on reforms. So that's one. Uh, that it is essential to simplify and to maintain business-friendly uh, regulatory environment in the country, that an urgent priority has to be given to revive growth, so the fiscal target may have to be relaxed in the current year. That's quite important. We'll be talking about that. That indirect tax collections have been muted from April to November last year, and that uh, India has been a dominant economic power uh, for over three-fourths of the world's economic history since 1 AD. Yes, that is what the chief economic advisor said. He also spoke about thalinomics uh, in the survey, saying that the absolute prices of a vegetable thali have decreased since 2015-16, although prices increased during 2019-2020. Let's listen to what he said. This chart shows that for, for close to three quarters of recorded economic history, India has been the dominant economic power in the world. So this chart goes from 180 to 2017. Obviously, the first thousand years are actually not up to scale. One, one two thousand is being shown in a smaller you know, period on the x-axis. Such dominance does not happen by mere chance. Such dominance happens by design. And what is that element of design? It is indeed our emphasis on wealth. Well, joining us on The Big Fight tonight, let me take uh, opening comments from all our panelists, beginning with Dr. Jayati Ghosh, Professor of Economics at JNU. Your thoughts, ma'am, on what you just heard and what your expectations are from the Finance Minister in the first minute, your opening comments. Well, what I've just heard, I really don't have any comments on. Uh, let's, let's focus on what uh, I'm hoping would happen and what I expect would happen, which are unfortunately two different things. I am hoping that this budget actually allows for an increase in public expenditure in areas that have very high multiplier effects. So specifically that would generate more employment uh, for such as rural development, the employment guarantee scheme, health, education, similar kinds of areas. I would really hope that there is a major emphasis on increasing public spending in these because we desperately need a revival of demand in the economy and uh, that's the best way to get it done quickly. What I expect will happen is unfortunately not that. I'm expecting uh, exaggerated estimates of both revenue and expenditure for the current year, which will probably turn out not to be realized. And estimates for the forthcoming year probably uh, which will actually not focus on employment generation, but will focus on trying to make it okay. business so you, friendly. You, you see a clear difference between what you hope and what you think will actually happen. Uh, standing with you is uh, Supriya Srinit. She's a uh, national spokesperson for the Congress Party, a former journalist who's covered the economy closely for many, many years. Supriya, your opening thoughts today, firstly on, on, on what you just heard. No, so thank you for having me here. And I think first up, as far as the survey is concerned, it seems to be an exercise done which is absolutely divorced from economic reality. The survey talks about uh, wealth creation and trust and very conspicuously misses how big inequality is in our country. It misses the reports, it misses the numbers that 1% of Indians actually occupy 42% of the national wealth. It misses the fact that trust deficit is at perhaps at an all-time high and it is perhaps only best mirrored in fiscal deficit. There are two big things that the survey has done today. It has paved the way for a higher fiscal deficit to be announced by Ms. Sita Raman tomorrow because it talks about fiscal slippage and gives excuses. It also talks about uh, attacking food subsidy and in some sense attacking India's poor and the thalinomics that you referred to earlier is once again divorced from reality because this prescriptive policy survey should have spoken about how to tackle consumption which is at multi-year lows instead it is talking about thalinomics and saying how food okay. consumption in India 
is your, all right, all which right. it isn't. Your one minute is up. Interesting thoughts there, Rajat Sethi, uh, who is an advisor to the Manipur Chief Minister, standing with you there, Rajat. Uh, your outlook, what does this survey tell you? Well, uh, two things stand out for me from this economic survey. One is uh, a relative optimism that has uh, uh, been demonstrated through this survey. It says that we have bottomed out uh, and we will move ahead with uh, better prospects in the H2, which is the second half of the financial year and in the coming uh, uh, financial years as well. The second thing is that uh, this embracement of uh, wealth creation as something which is also morally right is something which uh, comes out as a, a breath of fresh air uh, because for a very, very long time, wealth creation has always been seen as something which is principally unethical. Here they have said that wealth creation through ethical means is something which will allow uh, people to come out of the poverty and will be fruitful for the economy. And I think, uh, largely speaking, uh, a couple of things which could have been elaborated more would be around structural issues which the economy in general faces. It's a bipartisan issue and I think the, the economic survey should have delved a little bit more deeper into that. And perhaps second thing would have been around the, the trillion dollar infrastructure spend that uh, the Modi government okay. is banking okay. upon. Okay, important points there. Harish Damodaran is there with you, the Rural Affairs and Agriculture Editor with the Indian Express. Harish Damodaran, your first thoughts on the economic survey. Do you share the relative optimism? Did you see that as well, the way Rajat did? See, uh, as you yourself said, you know, they started off by saying, uh, 7% last July. And then from 7%, it comes down to 5%. So who's going to believe that there is going to be whatever, 6.5 and 7% uh, kind of a thing? See, there is a lot of, the problem is a lot with credibility. In fact, I found the most interesting chapter in the entire survey is the one, the, 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 there's a full chapter where they try to say that, no, no, GDP growth actually is not being uh, underestimated. You know, and, 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 and trying to say that, you know, because people are, are questioning the GDP numbers, that is in turn whatever causing, uh, you know, it is dampening the investor sentiment. Whereas I think, I mean, it is better to come down to earth, you know. So, so I, I think there is a problem of credibility. And today, the same CSO has, has revised downwards its growth, you know, from for, for 2018 uh, 19 from 6.8 to 6.1%. So I think, there is, I think there is a serious problem with, uh, you know, trying to acknowledge the problem and if you read the survey you just don't uh, think that there's a problem at all and there's a lot of homilies on uh, wealth creation through you know invoking Kautilya, Tirukural, yeah, everybody. We're going to talk about you know? that so, too. Yeah. Let me get Sanchita Mukherjee in. She's a senior private wealth manager. Sanchita, are you optimistic, hopeful or still cautious when you look at what lies ahead? Thank you so much Nidhi for this opportunity. I'd just like to start off saying that you know I'm here representing my own views as an individual. I do not represent any firm. Uh, yes, very interesting times, uh, the forthcoming budget tomorrow. We have seen a very sharp uh, slowdown economic slump that we have all spoken about over here. There's a lot of debate going on on the fiscal deficit numbers, how and when and how the government would be addressing the twin deficits and all of that. See, I'd like to bring about certain perspectives from the capital markets point of view, from being a capital markets person over here. Uh, let's date back one and a half years back, you know, the entire NBFC crisis that had happened a massive crisis, then the government was in an election mode. Uh, I'm not getting into the politics of it, purely economical. The spending had slowed down. There was a huge liquidity tightening which had happened. And the last six months, we have witnessed the consumer demand slackening quite a bit. Now, if one were to look at it and look at the couple of high frequency indicators in the economy right now, current times, I would like to correlate the two. So the GST... Uh, okay, you, your one minute is up, so you may want to correlate that a little later. Sure. So that's just, that's just to get, get an overview of what you think. So let's take uh, what all of you have said and, and, and just break that down. And, and Jayati Ghosh, I'll, you know, I'll start with you and talk about Harish Damodaran's point of a problem of credibility. Now that is very important because in la when, when last year's budget happened, a couple of months later, many of the things that were announced were actually rolled back and un they all unraveled because it, you know they were unpopular, they, they had consequences. And then you have... Uh, you know, the conflict over the GDP data itself. What do you think of the fact that the GDP data today also has been revised for last year from 6.8 to 6.1%? That's quite a drop. Yes, and I think Harish is absolutely right about the loss of credibility. And it's, it's more serious than just the GDP data. It even extends to the budget estimates because we now know that the budget in, that was presented in July gave, knowingly gave false numbers on revenue and expenditure. And we're going to get the final actual correct numbers for the previous year now. So in, in fact, we're dealing in a really in a no man's kind of uh, a previously un, 
unanticipated situation where you cannot trust any of the numbers coming out. And I think that's alarming. We do know all the other indicators are telling us that yes, there's a massive slowdown, that yes, nominal growth has actually fallen well below targeted growth, that is bound to affect your revenues, that in turn is going to affect your ability to spend. So we know that there's a tight spot that the government is in. How much of it it is going to recognize and how much of it it is going to declare are actually still open questions. Rajat, you raised your hand. Are you, you don't yeah, see that I there think, is a uh, question mark see, on the credibility are, of our numbers. I mean, see, you would require published, peer-reviewed published papers to get into what exactly the numbers are, where are the mistakes, etc. So that's an academic debate. But going into, uh, you know, uh, CSO revising his estimates, I mean, these are structures which are meant to, and they, they constantly they've been revising the estimates based on what new data comes in, how they're tabulating the data, etc. It takes time. Everything is an approximation when the number number comes in with the in the current fiscal year. So I think this should not be much of a concern because we've seen historically n number of times CSOs revise estimates when the uh, when they come out with the final numbers. But what and about the what about the economic there. survey? No, okay. Because I, the I, last I year the economic there. survey said that this year's growth would be seven percent. Right. And now it's sharply downwards to five. So that's again that's again a projection. So do you think so, that projections so if, always uh, if you, come true? If they're true? saying 6.5 for next year, right. I'm just, I'm just, look, I mean, I'm, see, not, I'm not an expert, but I'm just wondering, tomorrow, oh, can, who, can who I believe this number? If I have a point to make you there. You were there. talking about the finish. coronavirus as well, just, just a while back, and you were saying that coronavirus has really impacted Chinese economy. Now you see China didn't project this and like keep it into its projection okay. that some so coronavirus will Do we have a coronavirus so like see, situation all of these, here? All of these outlier events can change your projections. And but there were considerable uh, outlier events which happened in the last financial okay, that's year why, as well. Okay. So Supriya. I am glad you say that there were considerable outlier events because the government seems to be in denial about those outlier events, whether it is the fiscal situation, whether it's the tax collection. I mean, let's put things in perspective. For the first time in 20 years, direct tax collections have slipped. What does it tell you? Wages have gone down. Down and jobs have been eroded and to the other point that was being made about the CSO data the nominal GDP was targeted at 12 percent we are going to end up at seven and a half percent tax growth of 16 17 percent we will end up at 7.8 percent so I mean I understand outlier events but some amount of projection and some amount of smart data has to go into these projections are you telling me that the entire budget making team gets it wrong every time and the economic survey gets its projections wrong by two percentage points I mean this is then serious issue to deal with and which is perhaps why for the first time the credibility of our data is being questioned it has never been okay, done Raja, before. before I come to you Sanjita had 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 wanted to I think make a point on, on what was being said here about yes, the data I just clearly wanted to uh, talk about certain high frequency indicators in the economy as we stand what do you feel about the credibility yeah. of the so, data so uh, when we are looking at this entire situation of the slowdown and all of that there's so much that you can read into the numbers so when you're talking about the credibility of numbers let's understand uh, i don't disagree with any of you let's understand what are the ground realities now gst collection numbers have been very buoyant last two months in fact january it's projected to be close to around 1.13 lakh crore right Auto sales number, which were really dismal the entire last year because of various inventory issues as well along with demand, uh, have actually plateaued out. We see a lot of sectors like specialty chemicals, sugar industry, cement pricing, volumes are actually showing green shoots of profitability. These are all reflective of the Indian economy. So are when you saying talking you think about the worst NBFCs, is over? NBFCs, in fact, are you saying the worst is NBFCs over? A lot of NBFCs have actually run down their books. There's a lot of consolidation which is happening in larger sectors. PSU banks consolidation, private sector lenders consolidating. So credit cycle, I believe, would actually offtake in the second half of this year, which makes it a credible assumption to understand that the economy might be headed towards better times with credit situation improving, with demand and revitalization of the economy. So let me get Hari Harish Credit on that. growth was at 7.1% yeah. in December, down from 12.9% in April. In a matter of eight months, it crashed from 13% to 7%. Yeah. See, I think where we are underestimating is the informal sector. Yes. Yeah. You know, exactly. the, the MSMEs, agriculture and all these things. Mm -hmm. And these are underrepresented in the CSO data. Okay, so what happened is in 2017-18, you know, after demonetization, after GST, etc., the listed companies did well. 
okay because they improve their market share and and probably at the expense of the informal enterprises the small unbranded players okay so that created an impression that you know the economy is doing well and and all these things but what we fail to realize is that it is a, it is the informal economy that accounts for a bulk of our employment you know so when you have job losses there obviously it's going to have a have 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 an impact on 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 incomes on spending on and i think that is what is being played out i think this whole thing about slowdown it came into the front pages only when listed companies started doing badly you know when we saw sales by britannia also falling by by hero by, by hero falling two wheelers you know these kind of things whereas when my you saw thing, rural demand going yeah, down so yeah so i think you know rural and uh, this thing construction see till these things revive i don't see all uh, these things i mean So, and until yeah, we have very clear is, evidence of construction going so up I real estate going up agriculture uh, going up agriculture prices by the way are improving so now just, you know maybe yeah, that, so is, just, that is that is the one to, just to uh, add, green just shoot just to add to yeah, the yeah. green shoots that he was talking about just now the eight core uh, sector industries growth rate also came out it is 1.3% so after a slipping for past 2 3 months it has finally started growing so you are seeing that there are considerable and, and there are uh, if you look at the ima think tank the business positivity outlook has for the first time went into the positive domain so if you if you triangulate all of these information it does look like the bottom has is well past us and we are heading towards and that a much more hopefully the only way to go is up but what what did the chief economic advisor mean to say when he's talking about india's dominance as an economic power since 1 ad what did you think of that rajat i'm i'm just see, curious um, in in economic surveys and i was just looking at uh, the past 20 years of surveys they you know they come out with certain innovative uh, facts to put forth i mean there was talking about these uh, these unwanted girl births last year there were 21 extra girls that just born because uh, because of the want of a boy uh, being born in the family so they they do these projections just to make the economic survey much more exciting And well, it's for made the, our show more interesting. I, but no, I, I mean, I, I uh, more than that. No, these data are important points. I mean, we have seen these data being represented in various formats on, 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 on okay. through research papers. Okay, I think papers, historical reference is very good. There are physical papers which have been written okay. on this, looking at the so history of the economic. So, I think historical economic. reference is very good, but that historical reference seems to gloss over the fact that there were barriers to wealth even in ancient India. There were barriers to equality even in ancient india and those were even worse because they were caste based so why does we can't gloss over parts of our history to say that we were this world power which we no longer seem to be jethi well you know to be honest i would have hoped that the economic survey wouldn't obsess about the first millennia onwards you know i mean it's a little bit depressing that too many of the policy makers are really obsessed with the very very distant past and how good we were in science and apparently we also dominated the world economy and so on and so forth rather than what is happening today and i think today's economic problems are genuinely very serious they require an acceptance that they're serious and immediate action to do something about it it may be that there are green shoots in some particular sectors but we do know that overall demand is deeply depressed employment is actually negative and it's not just women it's now across so sectors so let me take a couple of you know individual issues and and, and look at them and first what rajat talked about wealth creation because that was important and that uh, sanchita was was a, was a highlight of this economic survey as well uh, this embracing of wealth creation hasn't part of the problem been that even this government has not embraced those who've created wealth and we've looked at the government has looked at businesses uh, with with a great deal of suspicion you know unleash the tax hounds on people Do you see that changing? Yes. Um, right now, if you were to look at business sentiments, uh, they are uh, a little on the negative side, and I think the government can do much more in addressing the business sentiments through the budget, uh, clearly specifying that we are there for the businessmen of this country. But I think uh, there are certain reforms, like the corporate tax rate cut, went again a very long way. Uh, a lot of people would debate it. Uh, help the listed companies and the bigger companies i would think not i think the impact of that would be 2 years hence it's not an immediate impact like putting money uh, in people's pockets directly like a direct tax cut would but having said that corporate tax rate cuts let's assume uh, whom does it really benefit a lot of mid uh, small micro caps are also benefiting from this tax rate cut a lot of startups uh, india has been projected to be the third largest but nation uh, in the uh, world but my question is different my question is whether you think the government is out of this suspicious mindset of those who who no. you know profit you know there there's still that mindset to like i said unleash tax terrorism on that and i'm not saying this industry voices are saying this so 
Is that has that mindset changed? Do you really think Not that? Not really. I, I I don't think uh, that the industry uh, uh, believes in that in that situation. I think the industry and the markets believe that uh, the Indian economy, in a very pragmatic, in a very realistic, and a practical note. They feel that this slowdown which has happened, it's not a government intent. It has been driven by structural and cyclical issues. I completely agree with Dr. Jayati. There are, there's much more that the government can do at this point in time. A lot of action on the economy. But I don't think the government has unleashed a tax terrorism on businessmen as such. In fact, the government, uh, 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 to quote them, has actually addressed a couple of tax issues for businessmen in terms of trying to make IT tribunals uh, clearer, uh, working on it that Has it been enough, Supriya? You know, I have just one thing to say, and I'm wearing my former economic journalist hat here. I'm in touch with a lot of the economists I used to track previously. What they tell you on camera and what they tell you off it are two different stories. Well, we know because the, tomorrow the budget will be yes, out exactly. Of 10 so you know, they are everybody. very worried. They are very worried about the activism, and I'm using this word very responsibly, quote unquote, from an ED or a CBI or an income tax department. I mean, we are living in a country where one of the a founder of a really large startup like Cafe Coffee Day committed suicide and he blamed tax terror for it. He blamed harassment at the hands of tax man. And you, you look at industry after industry. I was speaking to an extremely important industry player in his power business. The total generation is X and he's got an income tax notice for 10 times of that. How is he going to ever pay up? So these are the kind of times we are living in. People are extremely fearful to voice their candid opinion on the economy because you never know which agency uh, um, you know, uh, tax you next. That's the word, and I'm I'm quoting one of the most prominent industry men of our country. You never know which industry will land at my door if I begin speaking candidly. Well, isn't that what happened in a way to Rahul Bajaj, Rajat? That when he so when he did speak let's about not criticism, get into political statements. It's not a political no, statement. No, no. He's not a politician. To, He's been as critical no. of Congress no, uh, of the Congress government. I'm, I'm saying he was as critical of the UPA and its and its eco uh, economy, but. You know, the way he got hounded online, for no, example, no, within hours. No, no, no. Again, so see, let me not get into the political debate. This is an economy debate. and let's. No, let's it's not a political ourselves. debate. No, Rahul Bajaj is not a politician. So there was a very important fact that was mentioned in, in, in the today's presentation by the, the chief economic advisor. He also said that all the companies which took, uh, because of the nexus with the Congress governments of the day, they took heavy uh, uh, loans from the, uh, from the banks whose fundamental business structures could not support and they are those those they are the same companies who have added very little to the growth story of india they have been principally responsible for the entire npa nbfc mess in this country so that also alludes and therefore uh, building up i mean you can't keep cribbing about what's what happened during the congress regime because we all know that the economy went straight down the gutters during that time but we cannot that's a very strong statement no, no, sir no that is pretty true not you were talking about not like not now now no, 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 political yeah. you wanted to stay away from politics no, but I'm saying then so, let's not get political so on this because Steering I'm away, just to just yeah. to finish my point, I was steering to away use from the, the word political gutter debate. Is very but I had to no, but I had to aim and respond to your political statement first. So, so respond what on we the need to of now, what I said what and not we need to understand gutter. is what the economic survey also talks about is that the invisible hands of market have to be strengthened through trust. That's the only way in which these hands would be strengthened. Otherwise, wealth creation without implicit trust in the society See, will now, be. See, that's another interesting point. I want to ask Harish uh, Damodaran about this because. You know, again, when you see uh, bank officials being then jailed or indicted for giving loans to companies, now, you know, that's, that's another sort of a, a chicken and egg situation or bureaucrats, or you know, so we, you know, what does that board then, you know, in terms of wanting to lend for new businesses, etc. I, I, I mean, that also sends out a very worrying signal, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you do have to clean up the banking system. I'm not saying you don't, but is, is it sort of going the other way? See, actually, if you see the last, say, seven, eight years, how many new entrepreneurs can you think of? See, apart from, say, a Baba Ramdev or maybe a Flipkart, you know, all these guys who are in this business of uh, whatever, e-commerce, this kind of a thing, there are no new entrepreneurs coming in. Whereas if you look at the <laughs> earlier, whereas if you look at the earlier post-liberalization period, there were a lot of uh, new not entrepreneurs who came across all fields, not just IT and all these things, even, even in things like textiles and all. So I think basically there is, a, there, is a, there is a serious crisis today in private capital today. You know, the private capital, for whatever the reason, they are not, they, they, they they're just not investing, you know. And uh, I think this survey is probably, it, 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 is, it is probably, uh, it follows from what uh, Narendra Modi gave in his Independence Day speech, you know, where he extolled wealth uh, 
uh, creators saying that they need not fear you know they should be they should not be looked at suspiciously that kind of a thing so i think it's more a sort of a reaching out exercise but 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 it's a very serious concern that we are not finding new yeah. entrepreneurs the supply of new entrepreneurs has come down and that is a crisis so uh, so uh, the, so 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 it is going to take time you know unless you have risk takers people who are willing to put their money and bankers who are willing to lend so so to that extent definitely a, fear yeah, in the system fear in the system is a concern i just have i just have mr so chandrajit banerji i just have mr chandrajit banerji the director general of the ci with us for 5 minutes because he has to leave uh, he's joining us uh, uh, this evening mr banerji what what did you think of the fact that the economic survey has revised uh, its gdp target now for this year to 5% down uh, 2% from what it had earlier projected and even the growth for last year from 6.8 to 6.1% now yeah i think uh, one of the things which i think uh, the economic survey has been pretty uh, reasonably optimistic if one can say uh, towards the growth uh, figures that one has really talked about and it is also suggesting that we have uh, the worst is over and that that one sees sort of green shoots around uh, but i think uh, what really needs to be seen is uh, the uh, number of uh, you know uh, uh, number of uh, uh, thoughts that it has really talked about whether we see how much of it will get carried out in the budget in terms of both reforms in terms of also seeing the type of space that one uh, one sees uh, the types of the, the it talks about value, uh, wealth creation and uh, you know the partnership the, the trust the, uh, the that component of it has pretty much come in the market uh, uh, say forces Uh, all of that would need to be seen uh, as to how it comes out in the budget we have uh, we hope that the budget would reflect quite a bit of what has really come out in the economic survey which then it would uh, which would uh, which would then be able to uh, hopefully realize the type of uh, triggers or the type of targets that the economic survey has really talked about Now in terms of the growth the economic growth. survey is is optimistic but are you optimistic i i, I mean are, are you saying that the health of the economy is is okay or uh, uh, that that it is going to be okay do you, do you do you i mean genuinely believe so that so the health of the economy i i would imagine that we we i would imagine uh, uh, going forward we we should see that we have bottomed out uh, number 1 number 2 we would also expect to see that the budget does create those uh, uh, like, uh, parameters which would help us uh, really get into uh, a growth trajectory which is uh, which is uh, indeed critically required Uh, uh and and that's that's very very important we need to see the type of uh you know uh, uh space a, a on the fiscal side the type of government spending that would need to co co uh, uh, continue the type of uh, ease of doing business which is very very critical so there are a number of factors which are required and we would like to see a uh, quite a bit of them coming in this very very important critical budget which comes tomorrow and i think it a lot depends on, you... on that and i'm sure that the uh, the government would really really look at look at that very very seriously what are the two there are lots of recommendations which have Sorry. which have been given what are the two most important things that you would i mean if you had a wish list for the for the finance minister uh, tonight what would that be what what are the two things you really want to see in this budget <laughs> no i would think that uh, th there is uh, you know uh, 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 with a lot of care uh, we would need to see how the fiscal is 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 is, is, is ut utilized we would really need to see a clear case of more government spending on on, on the on the infrastructure and related sectors we would like to see a huge focus coming on the budget on jobs and i think that's very very critical it has to be a job oriented budget Uh, uh like uh, 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 therefore and which can come from critical uh, 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 critical intervention on on creating creating demand and i think it's extremely important uh, i mean if you really take to, to ask me about these two uh, one is the economic tool that it can uh, and can give and an overall focus on creating jobs which is at this point in time extremely important and it, it, if you really look at the economic survey i think that also comes out very very clearly that uh, creating jobs and enabling environment of creating jobs is going to be most most important all right well mr banerji thank you for that and for going into those specifics as well we'll see you tomorrow after the budget uh, uh, and thanks very much for joining us in fact jayati ghosh a lot of what he was saying is what you actually said at the beginning on the need to spend more uh, on infrastructure to focus on jobs and this is something i want to ask everyone given 
the concerns about the fiscal deficit. Uh, many have argued that the government should not you know, be worrying about the fiscal deficit target so much. They need to spend more. Mm -hmm. You would say that that, that, that should stand? Absolutely. This yeah. is a situation of depressed demand. The government is currently the only agency that is actually able to increase demand. Private investment is not going up. Households don't have money to spend. Agriculture is in a decline. You really need public spending. You absolutely have to have it. So I completely concur with that. I just want to make one point about trust and all of that which was going on here. You know, you can't set... Uh, you can't set targets for the Central Board of Direct Taxes and tell them go out and collect so much lakh crores every month and you are free to do what you like and then say that there's no tax terrorism because it's going to happen on the ground whether you like it or not. Yeah, I mean, sorry, Raja, do you want to answer that question on tax well, terrorism? Well, I really wanted, I was really shocked and surprised to what uh, uh, you said, which was mostly a uh, subjective statement that you uh, stated that, no. see, we have not seen any startups coming in. Any data that you could quote, because I have a thousand data points which I can quote. In 2018, Aggregate investment no, in 2018, is down. no, the venture total capital. Total investment is down. Yeah, okay, let me. Total investment is no, down. No, no, let me, let me finish this okay. point, because he talked about startups, that you haven't heard any startup story. Perhaps you stopped reading newspapers ever since Congress lost the government. See, no, I can no, I, Nidhi, I can tell you there is OYO, there is Everybody Ola, there is Paytm, there, there is there is Black Buck, there is Deliveries. Have you not heard about these companies? And let me give you an aggregate number as well. What about outside outside e-commerce? Venture capital and private equity e growth has been fifty six percent year over year. He mentioned it's, it's, e it's been forty billion dollars in I, just I, I will half of the annual year. To you and this, the previous fiscal. This statistic is from the economic survey last year. One second, one second. concur with this data point? What else is? How many greenfield? Investments have come. No, I mean you talked years. about startups, and I can give you a thousand no. names of startups. No, 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 no. I, I said, no, he said, said that. I have said, you heard any no, name no, no. of the startups? I want to just quote. I said new entrepreneurs are all in a very narrow no, sector of e-commerce. No, these are all as diverse as possible. How no, diverse? No, how how different the flip chart from mobility? Right from electric mobility, wait, 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 mobility has those? been working Rajat, Rajat, I just you, want to quote, want to really from, really just want to quote from last year's if economic really survey. Last year, the chief economic advisor survey said that private investment is the key driver for demand. And then you had the CMI data that came out for September that new investments dropped to a 16-year low by 59% in September 2019 compared to the previous year. I will give See, you another figure. What talking are two Investment very numbers. Things, I will. No. It was, How are they it was no. a point that was the raised gross was, a, was not private not. investment. The okay. point that was raised Investment was, is tracked only by one statistic. This can is, I please I, come I, in? I, I, investment. I, I, I okay, want so to clarify. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to clarify. Yeah, sure. What I'm saying is in the first say 20, 25 years after liberalization. You had new entrepreneurs in different sectors, you know, cement, sugar, steel, textiles, uh, IT, pharma, everything. Whereas here, now what you are seeing is just in this particular there sector. Is, there is only one No, no, no. I, I, are you saying we don't need any cement plants? No, are you saying we don't need, uh, we don't need agro processing? There is limited innovation which is happening in a cement plant period. There are a lot more, okay. lot more. Of course, okay. there is only one statistic. At that point. Okay, that is true. So there are much more statistic. newer areas of innovation. May I go ahead? Okay. No, oh, ma'am, I haven't finished statistic. my point. Okay, okay. Because you guys are going on. No, there, there is only one statistic that matters on investment. One second, one second. Supriya, 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 can Supriya please be? You're just hogging the discussion, you know? You have to let others speak. I just you, made a point. Is there a rational counter speak. to that? You have to, yeah, let, you have to let them speak. You have to let them speak to counter that. I think okay. the One. only statistic that matters on investment is gross fixed capital formation. That is at 28% of the GDP, which was at 38%. Unless 41%. And unless that doesn't grow, growth will not pick up. We can keep debating. We can keep hyperventilating. Your investment rate has to go up for the growth to pick up. And one more point on what Mr. Banerjee was saying, a little lighthearted comment. I interviewed him in 2018 and 2019. He told me each time growth has bottomed out. That's what industry tells you on the record. But if this government is serious about reviving growth, they have to focus not just on jobs, which has to be point number one, but it has to focus on what Professor Ghosh is saying, yeah, it has to focus on reviving consumption. It is two thirds of our economy. You have given a corporate tax rate cut, which has accrued to a revenue loss of one and a half lakh crore rupees. That money should have been given to people to revive demand. And that alone will yes. put the virtuous cycle of yes. consumption, growth and investment back in motion. There is no other way to look at Indian growth because consumption is two thirds of your economy. You ignore it at your peril. Let me get Sanjita in on this, on this issue of investment and how yes, to drive it. You.
uh, getting the consumption cycle started, I agree with you, can be done in a couple of ways. A, direct tax cuts, putting more money into the hands of the people, spending much more on social schemes, MN Rega, uh, Kisan Yojana, all of that, uh, adding up to the rural consumption, a bottom-up approach to the economy. The economic the survey does talk about the composition cutting food and subsidies quality though. and direction and of government people. spending. So when we say the government needs to uh, have a multiplier effect, uh, infrastructure push, infrastructure spend, I need to understand uh, the composition, the quality and the direction and the execution of the government spending on the infrastructure. 100 trillion was allocated for the next five years. Hopefully, this budget would see one-fifth of that portion being allocated and executed in the next couple of months. Creating more jobs. When we are talking about creating more jobs, it's empirical that the government addresses this situation by looking at sectors uh, which present, uh, I would agree with Rajat, a, a couple of uh, billion dollar opportunities in India. Why aren't we looking at waste management? Why aren't we looking at scrappage industry for medium and heavy commercial vehicles? Why aren't we looking at water management? A very meaningful private public enterprise collaboration attracting fee inflows could all be a plan of the government in the budget. This is how you will create meaningful jobs in this economy. Ha Harish Tamadran, you were disagreeing with something that... No, no, no. I, I don't, oh, I don't disagree at all huh. with her. W what she said is correct about this one lakh... One lakh, uh, what, one lakh thousand, what, a hundred, yeah. See, they should not talk these kind of figures, you know. If I were the government, I'll focus, say, on about ten projects, ten good projects, uh, dedicated freight corridor, finish it. Uh, your uh, Delhi Mumbai industrial corridor, finish it. Go for about 10, 11. Don't, don't give all these big numbers, you know. Go for it, you know, and have good execution capability. Where are the good public sector managers today? Where is a Varghese Kurian? Where is a US Avasti? Where is a, you know, you need those kind of uh, uh, people. So don't talk of, you know, big, big numbers. See, which again, you know, brings back this problem of credibility. See, you, you, you uh, when investors are no longer impressed by it. They want to see, like, for example, now now there is a talk of this uh, airport in Jhevar. Get that done. You know, you handhold the investors. Ensure that the land is acquired. Ensure that it is done. Focus on a few large projects. And the other thing which I believe which we should do is you should focus on rural incomes. You know, see right now what is happening is now prices, farm prices are slowly increasing. You know, uh, 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 at least at least they have bottomed out. Now why don't you why don't you just say that from now on there will be no stocking controls. You know, let, let uh, they won't be expo export controls. You know, you have uh, this thing. Let prices increase. You know, when prices increase, if, if sugar prices go up by, by 5 rupees, you know, that, that is going to put in something like uh, about, about 30,000 rupees into the, into the hands of a sugarcane farmer. You know, that will get spent. You know, uh, 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 allow milk prices to, to uh, 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 these things. So right now, I think the green shoots is coming from agriculture. Prices are slightly rising. And, and this is the time, according to me, you can do away with a lot of these uh, controls. Controls, you know, which were made in 1950s and 60s. You can play around with it and you will get investments there. And you must remember that the slowdown started in rural India yes, and sir. it can end only there. Uh, Nidhi, so we yeah, have to get Roger. out of this mindset of direct tax pays because 2% yeah. of India pays direct taxes. You have to rationalize the indirect tax regime. Taxes have to be lowered there. If the respite comes in on direct taxes tomorrow, we welcome it wholeheartedly. But the focus has to be rationalization of the indirect tax regime because that touches everyone. From the man on the street to the richest Indian, we pay the same rate of indirect taxes. Direct taxes is paid by a very small minority of people. Yes, they should get respite, but not at the cost of indirect Including taxes those of us being standing rationalized. Here. Including those of us standing yes. here. So if, if I had to but get a... the sentiments. I'm Largely. sure it will, but we have to look at and beyond sentiment. So I think one yes, of the things is just to wrap, income, before we wrap up, and I think this is a point that Harish well. Damodaran was again making, that uh, Rajat, is there too much of, with this government often, this, this obsession with headline management and, you know, with big numbers? It's actually true. Like, you know, let us have that $5 trillion economy by 2024. You know, or, you know you, we set these sort of huge targets, put these numbers out there, they become political slogans. And is that part of the problem, that we need to step back from that and maybe take Harish's advice and look at fewer projects and, and do those well, rather, rather than See, focusing on headline few, management. Uh, I agree. I mean, fewer projects. Fewer means 10 or 100 is a, is a subjective thing. And I think the government uh, uh, did agree to that, that there are certain important infrastructure-related projects whom we need to like uh, give a, a, a full push with whatever needs in terms of uh, being creative about 
uh, getting uh, uh, capital investments coming into these these uh, these projects. So I think that that focus is definitely there. And talking about the big numbers for any corporate or any organization, it's always these quarterly when the uh, uh, quarterly or yearly time when the the CEO comes in and tries to give a big horizon view of things. That's essentially what the leader can do is to get everybody together that yes, we are in spite of all the differences in opinion that we have, here is the grand target that we are all collectively looking up to. And in, in order to do that, you, you, set, you set stretched goals so that you can actually drive the momentum, drive the push and the morale of everybody around to actually achieve those. Okay. So is, now, it, is it a morale driving exercise? You know, if it is, then it's a very risky one because then it leads to what Harish was talking about. You actually then get a real credibility problem and people stop believing you after a while. And I, I'm afraid that's what's happened. But the $5 trillion thing ain't going to happen, right? So right. Not Doubling by 2024. You, you need to have, have what, 9% of growth every year? The most big important statements. thing about you know, the $5 yeah. trillion dollar economy is that the chief economic advisor was asked this question, that will you reset the target? And he said, no, we will get to $5 trillion by 2024. You are growing at 4.5%. To get to $5 trillion, you have to grow at 9%. Each year from here on, your investment rate has to be 38%. It's good. I agree with Rajat. It's good to target, you know, set high targets. But then you have to put all your might and credibility to achieve that. You're going at 4.5% and your chief economic advisor and every minister in your government says, no, we will achieve it by 2024. You may not believe data. You may not go by data. But data will be required. Statistics will be required to get to $5 trillion. And to me, that's nauseating if you ask me. So, so before, <laughs> before we listen dollar. to what Nirmala Sitaraman has to say, Sanchita, last word from everyone. Do you think uh, a lot of the criticism that the finance minister has been getting, has that been fair? especially in a government that's so over-centralized as this one, where frankly all the decisions come from the Prime Minister's office. Again, oh, and I'm talking about just the handling of the economy. Yeah, sure. So I will not make any comment which is political and uh, subjective in nature. My wish list to Nirmala Sitaraman uh, respectfully is uh, if she could kindly remove the long-term capital gains tax, that would be really helpful for the capital markets and the equity markets at large because I don't think the government uh, benefited much in their coffers by introducing it in 2018. Since then, the capital markets have just corrected and I think it will go a long way in ensuring that there is a wholehearted retail participation in the equity market which is the need of the R at this point in time because we are looking at greater financialization of capital markets, debt markets, increasing the debt markets. This is uh, this will go, uh, go a long okay. way so into boosting sentiment. Yeah. Uh, on, on the question on Nirmala you know, I would disagree with that one because there is no evidence that greater financialization of the capital markets actually gives you more investment. And that's what we need. We need more investment, we need more consumption, we need more employment generation. Um, in terms of is it her fault, I say no. I say it is a very centralized government. We all know who makes the decisions. And it's wrong to actually attribute all the blame to the finance minister. Supriya? I will second that and I will be a little sympathetic to Ms. Sita Raman and only and only because when the, when the prime minister meets top 10 industrialists of the country, she is conspicuous by her absence because she is meeting BJP Karikartas. Niti Aayog is calling for a budget meeting. She is conspicuous by her absence, but other ministers are present there. How then do you only blame her? Because this is the PMO show, so to say. And one more point on credibility. The Prime Minister meets top 10 industrialists 10 days before the budget. We all know the budget goes into printing a week in advance. Could any of the suggestions have been taken? Was this just a tea party? Was this an eyewash? What was it? And which is why I say the blame lies, if it is a centralized government like we can see it is, it lies at the doorstep of the PMO. Rajat? Well, largely speaking, I think this budget exercise is not business as usual. We uh, would really want the growth to rebound in a much more stronger way. So I think there will be certain, uh, certain exceptional steps which uh, uh, the Honorable Finance Minister will have to take. And essentially, uh, we will have to... Is she the one taking them? Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, she has been uh, roaming around the country, talking to every, uh, She's in not every been in pocket, any, in every region. In to, a lot to, of the key meetings, like the Niti Aayog me meeting. In fact, Mr. Gadkari was there. Essentially, let me His finish my point. was there, but she wasn't there. This is the concluding statement. Let me yeah. please finish my point, Nidhi. Uh, so what I expect is that would this budget, I mean, budget is not the time for structural reforms, but at least uh, we will have to start from some good day. 
So I think some tough reforms will have to come into in order to really uh, unleash the, the animal spirits. And this is the, the, the true time when, uh, and every, every such, such moment when you have crisis uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, uh, growth not reaching up, matching up the aspirations of the public at large, uh, is the time when you can introduce tough reforms and, and, and see the benefits of it in the long Harish run. Harish uh, Three things. The, the first thing is no more shocks, okay? You already had GST. You already had uh, uh, demonetization. Uh, demonetization. Now you have CA. you know, people running around. We don't know too much of uncertainty. In an uncertain uh, environment, people won't spend, businesses won't in invest, etc. Okay, so no more, no more shocks. That's number one. Number two, I think, do, I, I, I think, I, I think, uh, let's recalibrate growth estimates. Don't, don't give this 22, uh, tr whatever, five trillion and all these things. Aim for something lower. Don't, don't go for too many projects. You know, don't, don't, and, and, and de definitely don't come out with all these vanity projects. We don't need vanity projects. We need very clear this thing. According to me, dedicated freight corridor can be a real game changer in terms of increasing uh, 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 in India's competitiveness, etc. Number three, I think now the time has come. To to uh, to scrap the Essential Commodities Act as far as when it comes to as far as uh, uh, coming to uh, stocking of uh, agri produce is concerned and uh, with to do with uh, export controls etc. I think that will really help boost uh, farm prices and when farm prices go up, I think uh, consumption will be back. Well, thank you very much to all of you. I think you've all given some very interesting suggestions as well. We've not just ended up actually having a big fight, but actually talking about something constructive too. So thanks a lot. Let's see what the budget finally brings. Thanks for joining us. Good night.